Well, good morning, and uh, we'll get back to some more of that fellowship a little bit later. We've got some things to make sure to cover uh, this morning as uh, we turn to the Word of God. But a couple things that I want to mention, I want to make sure very clear from this pulpit and uh, from anyone that's speaking from it, uh, believing in this stand that you and I have been called to make against abortion. We have a Proposition 1 now on uh, the calendar uh, for this upcoming election, and uh, Abortion 1 is, uh, I mean, Proposition 1 is really abortion on demand here in California. Uh, Gavin Newsom is uh, a Democrat. We have a uh, Democratic-run state here in California, and I believe that it's a, a much about uh, the church not standing up for what God has called us to stand up for, and that is to make a, a stand against. He wants to enshrine in our Constitution uh, that this is a sanctuary state, that men, uh, women can come from all over the country uh, to this state to have abortions when they can't have abortions legally in other states around the nation. And so he's opening the door, the floodgate, if you will, uh, for California to be the bloodbath state in America is what he is doing. Abortion is murder. Make no mistake about it. Abortion is murder. I thank God for his grace and his mercy that has allowed for forgiveness to be had Uh, to those men who have pushed women into getting abortions and women that have made decisions to have abortions. But let's not make any mistake about it. Abortion is murder. Uh, It is uh, too well documented now with the science that we have that life starts at conception. And so the new DNA that takes place uh, immediately allows for us to know that that no longer baby in the womb is your body. It is the body of a newborn baby given by God Almighty. And so we need to make a stand against this Proposition 1. Vote no on Proposition 1 and not allow for uh, it to be enshrined in our state constitution uh, and allow for this to become a bloodbath state. You and I recognize, don't we, the the horror of this atrocity going all the way back into the Old Testament when babies were sacrificed on the altar and how it was that God in His infinite wisdom came against that practice. And so let us be a church that stands up against abortion and that uh, continues to be able to preach that we should be those that speak out uh, for the infant, speak out for the one that is innocent that cannot speak on its own behalf, that is appointed to die. Proverbs 31 tells us that that's a responsibility of those in the church. And so I pray for each one of you that you'd have boldness in this area and that you'd not allow for... Uh, the pressures, the peer pressure, the the pressure of the world around us to be able uh, to have you silenced. The problem with the church today is that we've been silenced by uh, the world around us rather than standing up and boldly proclaiming the Word of God. And it is time for us to make that stand here in California. Vote no on Proposition 1 to save babies. In the womb. And then there's another California State Bill 107 that is on the books that I just want to make you aware of that you would write to your senators, that you would write to your congressmen uh, about. And 107 means that your child can now be taken away from your custody if you do not affirm gender reassignment surgery. It's absolutely crazy, isn't it? It is absolutely crazy, church. But, once again, it is our fault. It is for us not standing up 
against this nonsense that is being pushed and the agenda being uh, one that is really crammed down our throats now to make it law that they can actually take your child from you if you do not agree and affirm them having gender reassignment. That is Senate Bill 107. Make sure that you send a letter, a note, a text, uh, email to our senators and uh, to our Congress to be able to tell them that we absolutely do not agree with that Senate bill. Well, with those things being said, I I just think it's important that we recognize (laughs) so many people in the church today are saying, well, you know, stay out of the political arena. Listen, Jesus was all over the political arena. Amen? And we are called to be those that are involved and engaged and make a difference in the political arena. And so let us be those that understand, yes, of course, we're going to turn to his word, but beforehand being informed so that we can make educated decisions on making sure our representatives, governor's representatives, all the way down in our state know that we have an opinion and that opinion is being expressed. Protect the children and don't allow for the nonsense of the transgender uh, agenda to be forced on us even to the point even to the point now in that proposition that you can be arrested if you're a parent that does not affirm gender transition it's crazy turn in your bibles to uh third john we've been through the first two epistles of john uh john one and two and so we shall continue in his grouping, if you will, of the epistles and look at John uh, 3, the epistle of 3 John. In your Bibles, there at the back of the Bible, let me just give you the first verse. It says, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. And so the term elder comes up again. It refers to The Apostle John, who was a spiritual elder, Uh, you can look at the different definitions or characteristics of an elder in 1 Timothy and C, but John was certainly one that witnessed firsthand the Lord Jesus and his sufferings, his miracles, his death and his resurrection, uh, therefore making him, of course, a senior by the time he is writing this letter as well to all the churches and to be able to have a spiritual authority that is given to him by God as one to write, to pen the words of God that are, as the Word of God tells us in 2 Timothy, inspired by God himself. And so let us never forget that as we're reading through these epistles. Yes, John was a great man, and yes, John was a serious servant of the Lord, And yes, John was there walking with Jesus and saw the miracles, saw the suffering, saw the death, was even there for the resurrection to be able to see the Lord as he was resurrected. He was the one that Jesus would tell to take care of Mary, his mother, into your hands I commit her. Uh, He was a a, a God-fearing man, but this word that we are reading is God's word inspired by him for John to pen. So let us not forget that as we move forward and we see once again that it is whom Jesus showed his great love to. And now John is able to show in that same way the agape love to others. He says to Gaius, whom I love in truth. And so we see, if you will, John in this manner in him demonstrating God's personal relationship with him and the love that he knew of God himself being transferred to personal relationships that he had. This one with Gaius, as he writes to him, to the beloved Gaius. In John's Gospel, in chapter 1, and verse 20, he, he said this, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. 
John knew that he was loved by Jesus. He says, following, and also had leaned on his breast at supper and said to him, Lord, who is the one to betray you? He knew in a real personal way the love of God for him. And now we see that he is just transferring that love or allowing for that love to be able to be shared with others. And this one is with Gaius as he writes to him from Patmos. He says, The elder to the one I lo- beloved, uh, Gaius, whom I love in truth. And as we've traveled through the epistles of John, we've seen that to be, if you will, the premise of the whole of the package of epistles. John's writing constantly showing us that it is always love in truth. There is no other agape love, is what John is writing. There's only one kind of agape love, and that is one that is surrounded in truth or encompassed by truth. And the whole letter result revolves around that kind of love. But as we continue to read through the Bible, we find the whole Bible is exactly that. It is a love letter from God Almighty engulfed in truth. And you and I need to recognize that that's the only kind of love that God is interested in. A love that is bathed in truth. Jesus would say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. And so John begins his letter by reminding Gaius that everything about their relationship has been built on truth. And their relationship would continue in that truth, as he says, whom I love in truth. Truth, I continue to agape you in truth. And we need to know that all relationships need to be encompassed in truth if they're going to be a God-fearing, meaningful relationship. That's the only kind of real relationship that you want to have, is one that is bathed in truth. I tell men all the time when I first meet them, that their relationship with me has to be bathed in truth or there's no relationship at all. If I can't trust you to be able to speak the truth to me, then there's no relationship at all. And so it is that the Word of God comes very clearly to us speaking these things. Listen, we can deal with whatever the issues are as long as you're honest. We can deal with all the issues. Every one of us know that there's none righteous, no, not one, that all fall and fall short of the glory of God. All of us make mistakes. But if we're honest and truthful with one another, then we can deal with that and be able to take care of it, whether it's some kind of consequence that needs to be dealt with or if it is the grace of God that allows us to be able to pass through it. But we need to recognize that all real relationships, God-fearing relationships, are centered in truth. And that's exactly what John is saying. And it's important for me to remind you also as we look at this epistle that 1 John was written to the whole church. 2 John was written to a family in the church. And this epistle is written to an individual in the church. And the reason that's so important is because God wants us to know as a church that we need to recognize that we're loved in truth, that you and I are centered in this family, if you will, of God here being given to his truth. Again, that's why it's so important for us to be able uh, to go turn to his word for the centrality, if you will, of our worship service. We want to hear from God. It's great to hear from men, and it's great to pray with men, and it's great to worship with others, but we want to hear from God because God has things to say to you and I to help us be the men and women that we're called to be. Amen? And so we want to hear from God. But it's interesting as we look at that, that he wants to speak to the truth, but he also, the truth to the church, but he also wants to speak to us as the families in the body of Christ. And so that men will grow up to be strong leaders in their home and be able to help their wives, their children, to be able to be raised in the ways of the Lord. And then as individuals, 
God wants to speak to us as individuals that we might know His great love this morning and for us to recognize that that love is always going to be centered in truth. Colossians says it this way. In chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And so we recognize that God never speaks to us about duty until he helps us to know our established position in Christ as he starts out here as the elect of God. And so as he is writing, John is writing to Gaius, he starts out with beloved, knowing that you have this rightful position with me as you have it with God, one that is beloved by him above. Verse 2 says, beloved, once again, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And so what a great prayer for us to be able to learn from the Apostle John towards Gaius and that one we should have for all the, those that are in the body of Christ on a regular basis. I thank you for being a church that prays. And I thank you for being a church that prays. It's a God-fearing church that's praying for those in the body of Christ, not only when we're going through difficult times and sufferings and all kinds of health problems that we continually pray for. By the way, I want to say thank you to the church for praying for Pastor Mike's mom. She did not have to have her spleen removed. She's at home and recovering, and so praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Some of you also may have seen the prayer request for Pastor Brad's dad and him uh, going in for a uh, angiogram and the plug that was supposed to take care of the artery healing uh, did not seal and it was a very dangerous time where one could bleed out but they were able to stop the bleeding and uh, Pastor Brad's dad is now home as well and so praise the Lord. We believe in prayer, and we believe in praying for those in the body, and we need to continue. And we also need to continue to pray evangelistically for those that don't know the Lord, for family members that don't know the Lord, loved ones that still have not turned to the Lord, that are continuing to rebel against Him, that the Lord might open their eyes and might draw them to Himself. And so thank you for being a church that prays, but let us be a church that continues to pray, that doesn't stop praying, as the Lord says, pray without ceasing. Well, as we think about that, what a blessing it is to be able to see here that the Apostle John also gives us some insight into Gaius's spiritual life as him being one who is prosperous, or that he is a very committed man uh, to the Lord. Titus in chapter 2 says this, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men may be sober, relevant, temperate, sound in faith, and in love and in patience. That sound in faith is the same word in the Greek as used here as prosperous. And so the word that is being used is one to express that Gaius is a man that is serious uh, seriously committed uh, to the Lord. And so we look at this word and see that he is one in that manner. And we need to continue to pray this prayer over one another, even as John has prayed it over Gaius. Lord, let us be those that pray for one another, to continue to be those committed to you and given to you. Let us continue to be a church that prays for one another. Look at verse 3 and 4 with me for a moment. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in, tru in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And so at this time, what an important thing it is for us to be able to know some culture 
in uh, what was going on at the time that John's writing. Remember, the er this is the early church uh, time, and so there are many itinerant preachers that would go from one church to another to be able to deliver the Word of God. And as they were going to deliver, they would need a place to be able to stay. Gaius is one that would take them in and allow them to be housed. And so John's saying, the, the apostle is writing and saying, man, I speak highly of you, Gaius, for being given to walking in the truth or, if you will, carrying out the commands of God, being one that makes right decisions in your daily activity. And John chapter 2 and verse 3 of 1 John says this, Now this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. And so, church, it's not enough just to come into the sanctuary and hear the Word of God and, and to walk out of the sanctuary getting a donut and a, a cup of coffee and thinking that you fulfilled your religious duty for the week. It's not enough. It's not enough. The Lord says we must be doers of the Word, not hearers only. And so what John is saying to Gaius is he is saying, listen, I'm applauding you. Uh, I'm happy. I'm excited about getting um, uh, the reports of you walking in truth, of you doing what God has called us to do and being those that are hospitable. And it wasn't easy for Gaius because Diotrephes, who was a prominent leader, we'll read about him in a moment, in the church, was putting pressure on others in the church not to allow for these itinerant preachers to be housed and not to be hospitable to them, that they would just have to keep going through uh, their town and not being a, one that was obedient to the word himself. And we'll see that in a moment. And so there was pressure, if you will, from the inside not to allow for the itinerant preacher or the evangelist to be housed uh, and to be able to stay there in uh, their area. And so what is going on is that he says, look, I'm applauding you for being one that's committed to walk in the ways of the Lord. And then look what else he says before we move on. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth, which suggests that Gaius was a son in the faith of the apostle John. More importantly, the fact is that he says, no greater joy in the emphatic tense, which means he's continuing to do the work of the Lord. And John is continually being excited and happy about the report. So important that we see that it means that the apostle John wanted Gaius to continue more and more in standing for the truth and not letting the pressure of those around him, even one that was prominent in the church, to pressure him to being disobedient to the way of the Lord. And in Ezekiel chapter 18 it says, If he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just. And he shall surely live, says the Lord God. And so what a blessing it is to be able to say this morning, Peggy and I have seen plenty of heartache over the years in the ministry. Uh, but what a blessing it is for us to be able to say, even as the Apostle John did in that emphatic position, that we're excited about hearing when we get the reports of our spiritual children and grandchildren now walking in truth, continuing to walk out the faith, continuing to be able not only to hear the word, but to be doers of the word, and then the reports coming back to us. I just got a report this morning. It was several different short videos of those that are in the Philippines doing ministry with the children, and the children reciting verses and singing songs. What a blessing it is to be able to see and hear your children walking in the faith. Well, in verse 5 he says, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. And an awesome verse that we have here, the Apostle John once again says to Gaius that he is beloved. Now, once again, the manner of saying, listen, don't ever question this. 
that what I'm speaking to you comes from a heart of love and that you would be encouraged and strengthened by the love that we have one for another. And why is it stated? He says it. He says, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. And we need to understand that this man was a man of great generosity and that he would house those that would come. He would find a way to help those that were in need, not only in his fellowship, but the Word of God says here, strangers as well in the body of Christ. Turn to Hebrews for a moment, would you please? Take a look at Hebrews in chapter 13 for a moment because there's a beautiful verse that's here that that sometimes we pass over too quickly, I think. Uh, The Word of God speaking to us about being those that are careful uh, when we're entertaining strangers. And here it is in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers... For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation or not, but I have a few times now where I've entertained a a stranger and helped them out in some manner or another, uh, only to, to turn around from helping them and they're gone. They vanished. They're not there. Uh, they've spoken something into my life that was God, God-fearing and, and, and a blessing from the Lord. And I turn around to be able to, you know, speak to them again, uh, to be able to have conversation with them. They're gone. I look around. I, I you know, walk both directions and, and, and can't find them. And I think to myself, what a blessing it is to be able to have this passage of Scripture in there. You don't know who that person is. You know, sometimes you'll deal with those that are homeless, right? And you want to help them. And and my policy is, your policy is your own. My policy is never to give them money, but to always ask how I can help and to be able to offer them a meal and go down to whatever it is that's close, Jack in the Box, Del Taco, whatever it is, and get them a meal and bring it back to them and then be able to pray over them, to offer them the place of U-turn for Christ that we have with Calvary Chapel, Roma Land, to be able to bring them to. But there have been times when I've ministered in that manner and they're gone. And I think to myself, could the Lord have just been testing me to see if I was going to be obedient to Him, if I was going to be one that would be committed to the things of the Lord. It is that you and I need to be careful, of course, but we need to be those that recognize there are times when God tugs on our heart that we are to be hospitable. Sometimes it's not easy and sometimes it's not comfortable or convenient, but there are times when people need help and that God puts in front of us with us having the means to be able to help. And we need to be those that recognize God causing Uh, calling us to be those that are hospitable. Romans chapter 12 and verse 13, distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality that we might be those that see it is a command from God, I believe, another test strip, if you will, of our faith to be those that are ready to help. Well, we go on into verse 6, and it says this, who have borne witness of your love before the church. And so what a cool thing it is for the love of God that we have, the love that we have for the Lord Jesus Christ to be shown to others in loving them. And how cool is it that God somehow always makes those times that are pure and innocent and only to the Lord that are spiritual be uh, shown to others and others to be able to recognize that's what's going on here is Gaius has been one that is following the command of God he's been hospitable he hasn't been hospitable so someone could pat him on the back he's been hospitable because he wanted to be uh, uh, given to the word of God and as he is given to the word of God others have recognized it and seen it and have reported it back to John who is still at Patmos uh, in prison. 
What a blessing it is to be able to have God move in that manner. And the Apostle John commends Gaius for bringing those into his house, those God-fearing preachers that would allow for him to be able uh, to minister to them as they're moving you know, through the countryside, uh, giving word uh, to the different churches. And so the testimony to the Apostle John has come of Gaius being one that is committed in that manner of hospitality as well. And verse 6b goes on, he says, If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well, because they went forth for his namesake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. And so the Apostle John says to Gaius, listen, I've heard of your hospitality and that you've done well in being able to bring them in, but wait a minute, don't stop there. Be a part of being able to send them off. Be a part of the ministry that is going to take place for them as they continue to go as itinerant preachers from one church to another in sending them forward, he says, on their journey Uh, in a manner worthy of God, then you do well. So it's as the Apostle John says, wait a minute, I want to make sure that you just don't house them, but that you give them substance, that you give them something to go, some kind of provision, some kind of financial allotment to be able to help and extend uh, them going in to ministry and to doing more ministry. It's really a passage of Scripture where I personally believe the Lord has called us to be those that care for minis- uh, missionaries, that are careful to be able to help them continue in the work that they're doing around uh, the world. And so notice with me, the Apostle John is saying, in a manner worthy of God. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel for a moment and to chapter 10, if you would. As we think about those words that, Uh, the Apostle John wrote, in a manner worthy of God. It is that the Apostle John is really just recording for us, or he is reiterating for us uh, the words that he heard from the Lord, the teachings that he heard from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As God the Holy Spirit is allowing John to remember those things that were taught to him john uh, matthew 10 and look at verse 40 if you will for the lord says this he who receives you receives me and he who receives me receives him who sent me he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward now go back with me to third John and look at what he says in the manner worthy of God but he says this because they went forth for his name's sake and that we may become fellow workers of the truth the Lord Jesus said to us listen receive those people help them be a blessing to them and you'll reap the rewards of them And here's the Apostle John telling us the same thing. Listen, as we're a part of being able to give to those that are going out, supporting the missionaries that are moving throughout the world and spreading the gospel, we become workers, fellow workers, for the truth. And what a blessing it is for us to be able to be a part. Not everyone can go into the mission field, but we can all be a part by being those that support, by being those that make provisions, by being those that are hospitable when they come back to allowing them to be able to stay with us while they're here. What a blessing it is to be able to have this passage of Scripture in John. It's a a letter really that almost reads like the Proverbs do and that it shows us what is right and then it shows us what is wrong. Remember Proverbs saying, Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. And we move into that second part, if you will, of the letter as John turns the page and speaks of now not Gaius so much as one who loves the Lord and 
is committed to the ways of the Lord, but the one that he spoke about earlier, Diotrephes, who was one that was against the Lord. Look at what it says, verse 9. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. So look at why Diotrephes is being called out by the Lord. It says that he loves to have the preeminence, or that he was a very prideful man. He was a prideful man and wanting to use his position as the church, in the church as a means to have others looking to him rather than looking to Jesus. Looking to him rather than being one committed to the things of the Lord. He allowed for his position to puff him up so much that he couldn't any longer allow for, and here's the key, one that was a prominent position the Word of God really has a, a, um, the kind of idea of him being a prominent, in a prominent teaching position. Didn't want an itinerant preacher to be able to come and take the pulpit because they might expose his heir. What a Word of God that we have here. Powerful position in the church abused by men. And today we have it all the time. The powerful position of pastor in the church, one that is supposed to be the servant of all, one that is supposed to be able to divide the word correctly and allow for the people to be able to receive it, come into a position of lording over the church rather than being one who is hospitable, obedient, committed to the things of the Lord. Proverbs 29 says, A man's pride will bring him low but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Verse 10 goes on. He says, Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, pratting against us with all malice uh, words or malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church, beloved, Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. And so there are really three actions that come to us from Diotrephes' deeds that the Lord shows and and spells out here through the Apostle John. The words which he does, holy, is again in the present perfect tense, which means Diotrephes didn't do it just once, but he continues to do it as a continuation of him being one that's given to sin. And the first thing that he says is that he speaks ill of the Apostle John. He says, prating against us with malicious words. And that alone should be enough to be able to have him removed from any position in the church as the Apostle John has already established himself as a servant of the Lord Most High for many years. First Timothy in chapter 5, verse 19 says this, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. It is that the Lord is saying, Listen, Diatrophes is coming against me, an elder in the church, on his own, because I've called him on the carpet of being one that's hospitable, and to allow those in the church to be hospitable, not to throw them out of the church. And so the Apostle John has served some 50 years by this time, and yet Diotrephes is speaking ill of him. The second thing that he lists is that then outside Diotrephes is not content with that, he says. He himself does not receive the brethren. And so not only does he talk badly about the God-fearing leadership in the church, the Apostle John, but he's unbiblical in his position about hospitality. And he's um, unbiblical in his position about allowing others in the church to be given to hospitality. Titus in chapter 1 says this, A bishop or an elder must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable. 
a lover of what is good and sober-minded, just, holy, and self-controlled. Church Diotrephes was just too high on himself. He had moved into a position in the church that allowed to him to think that he was just too and high and mighty, even to call against John the Apostle himself. The third thing that Diotrephes is guilty of is the abuse of authority as he forbids those who wanted to be uh, uh, those that would be hospitable to the itinerant preachers coming through. But he wasn't only, you know, uh, horrible to them. He says here that he forbid them and threw them out of the church. He went to the point of saying, if you're hospitable, you're no longer welcomed here. It's not a church that I would want to be a part of. The abuse of the authority and not allowing those who were trying to follow God's word in regard to being hospitable to continue in fellowship with the body of Christ there. What a blessing it is to have Peter write in this manner in 1 Peter. Chapter 5 and verse 2, he says this, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when Christ the shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And so the apostle Peter says the same thing in a rebuking manner to all those that are in positions of leadership in the church and try to use their position as some kind of power authority uh, position to be able to uh, make those that are in the church bow down to them, to intimidate them. And the Apostle John goes on to say very clearly, he challenges Gaius as he says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Or if you will, he calls the church to be those that do what's right. He calls them to be able to dismiss the air in which Diotrephes is teaching and acting and to continue to be the ones that follow the Lord's command. And that is to be those that are ready to receive, to be hospitable to them, and then also to help them to continue in going on their way. He says, He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. And we know that one's conduct clearly shows and speaks, if you will, about one's relationship with the Lord. And that's exactly what the apostle is saying. He's saying you can see it proven out in their lives, whether they are really of the Lord or not. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10 says this, In this little children of God and children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. And so the word is a continued word, if you will. John speaking as the Lord has given him <coughs> clear uh, words to be able to give to you and I that they would be preserved for us. It's not that we look back on these words and say, oh, yeah, man, they had a mess going on in the church back then. No, it is for you and I to examine ourselves and ask ourselves this morning, are we being those that are hospitable? Are we being those that are committed to it? Are we in leadership being those that are using our position of leadership in some type of authority that's not becoming of the Lord? And so we have a chance to be able to look at these words and say, Lord, let me do an inspection on my own life. Let me look into the mirror of your word and examine myself. He goes on in verse 12. He says, Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness to you uh, and know that our testimony is true look now john flips again to one that we want to follow one that we want to be able to examine his life and then be able to be those that are committed 
in the same manner to the Lord as he is. And so uh, Demetrius is one that's been doing exactly what the Lord has called him to do. And look at it with me. Demetrius has the good testimony from all. John, it's interesting, shows us three different ways in which Diotrephes is just blowing it. Now he gives us three ways in which Demetrius is doing what is right before the Lord. You might note those three things, both on the wrong way to to live and, and to be before the Lord, and now the right way. Here he is telling us three things. Demetrius has a good testimony from all. It's very important as he speaks out these three ways to Gaius and that he knows that this is right. Gaius knows. He's seen Demetrius and he knows. But he says, John says, The word has come back to me, report has come back to me, that everybody sees Demetrius moving in a right manner before the Lord and before others. Second, he says, look at it with me, witnesses and from the truth itself, which means that the Apostle John has also heard that Demetrius' doctrine proves out, that that, that this man who is a, a God-fearing man and, and is a speaker, one that is teaching to the church, his doctrine is proving out to be true and a God-fearing preacher that can be acknowledged. 2 Timothy in chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes his last letter to the church. He says this, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. The command to pastors is to preach the word, to preach the truth. And Demetrius has been doing just that, his doctrine has been right. A man's doctrine will clearly tell you whether he has a real respect for the Word of God or not. And Demetrius certainly did. And the third way, as we look here, is knowing that Demetrius was a true servant, is that John says this, and we also bear witness, which means that the Apostle John was putting his stamp of approval on Demetrius as well. What a great confirmation for Gaius as he's receiving this letter, I'm sure, and knowing that the Apostle John backed Demetrius and was supportive of Demetrius and his love for the Lord and love for doctrine and his love for people. We finish with 13 and 14 of 3 John. It says this, I had many things to write, but I not wish to write to you with pen and ink But I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. And so the Apostle John writes in this last closing moments, Look, I hope to see you shortly. We'll talk about this more when I get to see you. And then he says simply, Peace to you. It is a manner of being able to say, With all that you're going through, Gaius, and with all the difference that you've got to deal with with Demetrius and Diotrephes both in the in the same camp and you happen to use wisdom in how you minister to them and to the rest of the church peace I call for God's peace to be upon you that you would just be one that is settled in the ways of the Lord and committed to the ways of the Lord so that you might not be disrupted or confused by all that's taking place. Peace. Get alone with the Lord. Spend time with Him so that you know that what you are doing and how you're committed is going to give you a reassurance of that peace that only God can give. And then notice one more thing before we close. How important is friendships in the body of Christ? As the Apostle John writes, look, Those that are here want to greet you. And please greet those that are there that are friends of mine. The importance of friendships in the body of Christ. I thank God for the friendships that we have in the body of Christ. And I pray that we would always be those that are continually looking forward to, working hard at, keeping those friendships vital. Amen?
Let's pray. Father, we come before you. Thank you for who you are and what you do. How it is that you speak to us from your word and minister to us the things that you want us to be able to consider this morning. There is much there to consider. And, Lord, it's time for us to examine ourselves. And so I ask that you would do the work that only you can do, even as we begin in that examination process. Examine ourselves from your word today, and examine ourselves overall, so that we might be ready to be able to receive uh, from the communion. The ushers are coming forward, and Pastor Augie is going to come and to be able to deliver the communion time for us. And so let us in this moment examine ourselves that we might be found worthy. You're only found worthy by the blood of Jesus Christ. My prayer is that all have bowed before him and asked him to come and be the Lord of your lives. If not, Pastor Augie is going to give you in a moment a chance to do that and then to be able to be a part of the family of God in receiving communion together. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love friend red and my sins washed white. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you, Jesus. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. Yes, I'm in all of you. Where your love ran away and my sins washed white, I owe all to you. Yes, I owe all to you. Jesus Be, uh, before we get into the text, I just uh, I want to share something with you guys first. Um, you know, the Lord convicted me a couple days ago because 
And it's no accident that now this morning, Pastor Jerry wants me to come up and do communion. But uh, what the Lord convicted me of is that sometimes I take the Lord for granted. I allow the busyness of life to get in the way. But we're called to have a grateful heart. Amen. We're called to always have the Lord in the forefront of our mind. And sometimes the cares of this world, our busy schedules, and other things that are going on, we allow the Lord to be removed from his rightful place, and then we replace him with the worries of this world. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, 23, starting in verse uh, 23, it says, For I received from the Lord, and this is Apostle Paul speaking, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, May we lift our cups up, please. The Lord says, Take Eat this, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now that wafer that we're holding right now, yes, it's just a wafer. But we need to remember what it represents. It represents Jesus' broken body on that cross. As before he took his last breath. Remember, all that pain, all that anguish, all that humility, he bore all that for me and for you. For our sins, that we would never, ever, ever be able to pay for. He bore it all for us. You may partake. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now as you hold that cup in your hand, again, yes, it's juice. But what it represents is the blood that Jesus shed for us. Do not allow the cares of this world to ever get in the way. Do not allow the cares of this world to ever remove that memory from our minds of what the Lord did and the blood that was shed for us. Amen. There's power in the blood of Christ. You may partake. He went on and said, this cup is the new covenant. I'm sorry. It says in verse 26, he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The apostle Paul says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. We don't have to wait till we're in church doing communion to remember what the Lord has done for us as Christians, as believers we need to continually remember that every morning when we wake up, when we go to bed, we need to remember and give thanks for what the Lord has done for all of us and what he's going to continue to do. Never allow for this part, the communion, to be a part of religion or tradition because it's a way of life for us. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> 